Welcome to Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast. Each week, we check in with our capital correspondent, Sean Kitchen, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly that is Harrisburg, PA. We're now on iTunes and Stitchers, too. So, hey, subscribe to the podcast and leave us some feedback there. Really help plug the show. And if you like what you see there, if you like what you hear on this podcast, you like what you see on RagingChickenPress.org, why don't you think about becoming a member of Raging Chicken Press? You just go right to the web website, RagingChickenPress.org, click on the support and membership tab and become a member for as little as $5 a month, right? Really help us out. Keep progressive activist media going strong in the state of Pennsylvania and beyond. And if you're interested in contributing to Raging Chicken Press, you know, if you're a videographer, if you're, uh, you know, an aspiring citizen journalist, you know, well, why don't you just drop us a line? Drop me an email at ragingchickenpress at gmail.com or send us a direct message on Twitter. We're at RC Press on Twitter. Uh, we began Raging Chicken Press about five years ago, be five years ago this July. And we provided it. The idea was to provide a platform for homegrown, progressive citizen journalism and media activism. So if you've got something to say or you just want to learn how to do this work, drop us an email at ragingchickenpress at gmail.com. Let's get rolling. So it's primary day in New York. Big, big day. We're one week away from Pennsylvania's uh, primary. And, you know, frankly, uh, between this week and next week, we might just see uh, the races, uh, both on the, the Democrat and Republican side, get put away. Um, depends on what kind of results we'll see. But lots of stuff going on. But we'll get into a little bit about some of the primaries in Pennsylvania um, and uh, the presidential race a little bit later. But today, we start with some big news out of Harrisburg. I mean, I don't know how to how, how else to call it. It's like huge news out of Harrisburg for a story that uh, uh, Sean has been covering for quite some time. And we'll turn right now to that guy, Sean Kitchen, our Capital Correspondent, Raging Chicken Assistant Editor, Sean Kitchen. Sean, what is going on in Harrisburg? I hear everyone's stoned. Is that right? Well, not exactly, but <laughs> we're, we're getting there. Um, medical marijuana finally became law over the weekend. Uh, Governor Wolf on Sunday signed the medical marijuana bill. It, it was like a two and a half year fight. And it's great to see this actually happening. I think my opinion is one of the most transformational pieces of social legislation uh, we could be seeing maybe in the past uh, few decades, past generation that is what Dale and Leach said. What, what do you think? I mean, you've been covering this story for a couple of years now. Um, and following the activists that have been involved, um, who've shown up at the Capitol, who've held, you know, um, all sorts of demonstrations and lobbying efforts, um, both in the Capitol and around the state, frankly. Um, why do you think that we finally got to this tipping point? I mean, what pushed it over? Well, there's two things. So going back to 2008, 2010, that session, uh, State Senator Dalen Leach and Representative Mark Cohen out of Philadelphia, they have been pushing for medical marijuana bills for quite some time, but they were never able to get a hearing on such legislation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until, I believe it was 2011, 2012, when CNN aired that documentary um, with Sanjay Gupta, and they were talking yep. about the medical marijuana and what, this, what, it, what that has done in Colorado for a lot of people. And um, that really inspired a lot of mothers who have children with Dravet syndrome and other epileptic uh, disorders. And after that, they start calling their legislators. And um, one legislator in particular, who's an ext uh, you know, extreme social conservative, Mike Fulmer out of Lebanon County, he really became the advocate in the Republican caucus that got this bill over the hump. Um, he teamed up with Dale and Leach. You have a like someone who's an extreme progressive and an extreme conservative teaming up, and they were actually able to get this bill through the Senate last year. Um, it sat in the House for the past year and some months or some weeks, and then it finally became – it was voted on a couple months ago, and it was concurred back in the Senate last week and was concerned con – or was concurred in the House last week. That's pretty impressive. And, I, you know, and, and Fulmer got some serious props in the press conference on this Sunday, right? Yes. Uh, he actually should deserve most of the credit, in my opinion, for this. Um, mm -hmm. It's not really that often you're going to hear me praise a conservative like this, but he was the one who got the ball over the goal line. He was the one who lobbied in his Senate caucus to get this done. Obviously, there were a lot of Democrats who were on board with this, but within the Senate Republicans and even the House Republicans, Fulmer was the one who was able to convince the hearts and minds of a lot of these people. And you also got to give a lot of props to the mothers who were there. They've been yeah. pushing this bill constantly for two and a half years now. Um, Representative Mike Verb, who I've taken some shots at on the blog over the past couple of years, uh, was also came out and said this 
he became a believer when a family from Pittsburgh drove cross state to his district just to go to a town hall in his district to talk about this bill. And from that point on, he became a believer. And I really think that you get these actual families, you get these actual people in the building, in that capital, to actually talk about what's going on. That's when we've seen this change. Um, well, and I think that's a really, really important point because on the one hand, the Sanjay Gupta piece, I mean, I think you're right to point that out, is that was, I think, a, a, a that really- was the catalyst. Key, yeah, and that was a really key moment, not just here in Pennsylvania, of course, but across the nation where the kind of discussion shifted away from that image of like the pothead to actually the medical evidence, right? So that, but I think the important point, what you're, what you're, you're talking about the mothers who have been, you know, uh, who've been the activists behind this, I think that that alone, the evidence alone would not have gotten us to where we are today, had it not been for the advocacy and the activism and the persistence um, of that group of, of, of women and men. I mean, but those mothers in particular who kind of showed up and kind of pushed people forward. I mean, and I think that it really takes that to get things to that next level. Mm -hmm. And what they did since November, when you know the budget battle was going on, every session day, they had a mock waiting room set up right outside of the House Republican Caucus room with the sign said, still waiting, and had pictures of their sick children there. So every day, House Leader um, David Reed and House Speaker Mike Terzai had to see the pictures and the faces of these people. And um, that really irked Mike Terzai um, and the people and your um, and your people who are against this, like Matt Baker and others, mm -hmm. this pushed them to load the medical marijuana bill up with 300 amendments um, that leaked out of their own caucus room through some of the more conservative members of the House who were actually supporting this bill. And that, and then from there, uh, David Reed actually was the one in the House who got this over the goal line. And that's where Terzai Tears came from. Um, Terzai yeah, actually well, left. I mean I mean, I remember when, I mean, you published those amendments on Raging Chicken Press. I mean, once you, you know, once you got to see what they were actually planning on doing about how the legislative wheels, you know, or at least the kind of on the, the GOP side, how they were planning to kind of stymie this legislation and just kind of bury it under a bunch of, uh, you know, just bickering back and forth um, was, you know, it was important for people to see that, I think, you know, that this is what they were really trying to do. They had no disagreements over the medical aspect of it. Uh, they just did not want this to go. It and was pure reefer madness going on in that in that caucus with some of the more conservative members. But then going forward to Sunday, um, Representative Mike Verib, who was a former police officer who busted a lot of people for smoking marijuana, mm -hmm. I think he had a really good point in saying that now it's time to go after the real gateway drug in Pennsylvania, which is the painkillers and the opioids are leading to our heroin epidemic. That's right. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is in the middle. I think it has one of the worst heroin epidemics happening in the state. Mm -hmm. And in the you know, country, I mean. In the, in the country, exactly. Thank yep. you. Yeah. But it's also a transformational movement for the marijuana movement, in my opinion, too. Um, next month, industrial hemp is on the verge of legalization in Pennsylvania. There's going to be a pilot program for that. I think there's going to be 12 or 15 farms around the state that, are going to be, that will be producing uh, industrial hemp. Mm -hmm. um, We've seen decriminalization happen in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. It's about to happen in Harrisburg. Some of the state's largest cities are starting to decriminalize marijuana. And I really think we're actually starting to see a, a, uh, that transformation in the social movement or a, like a transformational movement or transformational process begin. It's something that where Pennsylvania is always the 49th or 50th state mm -hmm. to do something about it. We're always the last one, but now we're in that we're, we're like 24th in the state to 24th state in the country to legalize medical marijuana, and it looks like there's going to be a push to decriminalize marijuana in the statewide now. Well, and, um, I, I have activists. to. I, I have to say, I have to say, I want, I want to pick this up after the break. I want to kind of get into kind of where we go for where we go from here. But you know, I just can't kind of emphasize the point enough is that you know I really hope that people are going to pay attention to the activism um, that was done to get this to where we are today. Um, and not simply looking at this issue only um, but 
you know, the victory to, to gain medical marijuana. I mean, that alone, that's huge, right? I mean, how many barriers that people had to, had to cross and get past in order to get to this point is amazing. But the how of it, the persistence of the activism, both in the streets and in the Capitol, um, those kind of in, that inside outside campaigning was just absolutely incredible. But we got to take a quick break and we're going to come back. We're going to pick this right up. And we were going to go to talk a little about the primary search, but I really want to come back and give Sean a chance to talk about where this is going going because I do think this is um, absolutely critical. This is Kevin Mahoney from Raging Chicken Press. Uh, this is Raging Chicken Press's Out to Coop podcast. We'll be back after these messages. Not really, but we'll just take a break and we'll be back. See you then. Welcome back to Raging Chicken Radio's Out to Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney. I'm the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We're talking here today with Sean Kitchen, our capital correspondent and assistant editor. Um, right before the break, we were talking about um, the passage of medical marijuana legislation right here in the state of Pennsylvania. And, you know, Sean was making reference to the fact that, you know, Pennsylvania is usually last, like we're kind of usually pulled kicking and stream, you know, kicking and screaming into the next century, uh, but not this time around. And right before the break, we were talking a little bit about the activism that went into this. And um, Sean was just starting to talk about where we go from here. So Sean, if you could, um, Talk about how this recent victory um, is kind of positioning kind of medical marijuana activists or legalization activists. Um, you know, what's the, what's the agenda seem to be and where, where are things going to go from here? So I was able to have conversations with these activists inside the Capitol over the past few weeks. Um, you know, the people actually pushing this bill, sure, they had a lobbyist pushing it in the legislature. Um, they, they actually hire a lobbyist for this. But the activists who are actually in the everyday fight who have been in the capital for the past few months are looking at this as a victory and they want to build up to what's the next step we're going to take right they have a victory here they're going to use it as a building block to the next victory and they want to use it as a building block to the next victory down the road they want to do this in a step process right industrial hemp is going to be legalized next month as i was saying earlier now they want to push for decriminalization of, mar of marijuana across the state that seems like it's going to be the next logical uh standpoint they're going to take and really, I think it's going to be changing the dynamics, right? Um, we've had, and I really think that they also want to push for opiate controls too, mm -hmm. right? Well, states I that think have decriminalized marijuana, states that have legalized medical marijuana have seen re reductions in, um, her in heroin abuse. And it's why? Because heroin, opioids are, opioids are painkillers. Mm -hmm. And marijuana can substitute as a painkiller. And it's, it's not a dangerous drug as people are making it out to be. And I really think everyone's starting to realize that. Well, and one of the things, one of the kind of interesting points of that kind of trajectory that you just laid out is that you, you're you actually looking then at an expanding coalition, right? I mean, because this, the medical marijuana legislation, right? Um, you know, the face of that really has been, as you've said, and as you've written about over the years, has been um, these, these kind of mothers with sick kids, right? Who are seeking to get help for their, for their children. Um, and, but that is still a, a relatively small group of people. You know, when you think about the, you know, the state as a whole and that kind of stuff, not that it's insignificant, don't get me wrong, um, but it's a relatively small group. But when we start talking, now we start shifting into terms of talking about, you know, decriminalization and stuff. And now we're up against things like, you know, the, the prison industrial complex, right? We're up against the kind of the racism that's embedded um, in kind of our current drug legislation. And then from there, when you start talking about, you know, the opiate addictions and the kind of, you know, the painkillers as the gateway drugs to heroin, you know, right down, you know, Southeast Pennsylvania is like the Mecca for this pharmaceutical industry. And this is like basically big farmers that right here in our backyard. So we have a potentially really, really interesting way forward that this issue, while we're talking specifically about marijuana, about this one drug, we're really seeing this as um, kind of a gateway into a much broader discussion about, um, you know, economics and politics in the state. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how this goes. I know before I moved out to Harrisburg, mm -hmm. as you were saying, I lived in Horsham, literally right down the road from me in Horsham, on Horsham Road, as you're going to the Wegmans up on in the Montgomeryville um, area, Montgomery Mall, you have Teva and some of the mm -hmm. country's largest um, generic pharmaceutical producers right there. You know, this is in Montgomery County, in our own backyard, as you were saying. Well, look at, I mean, look over in Lansdale, you got Merck. 
I mean, Merck is like one of the largest pharmaceuticals in the world. Yeah, and it's going to be really interesting seeing how they go. I mean, my opinion, these pharmaceuticals were dealt, um, were they were dealt a defeating blow over the weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, how can something like a plant, you know, cannabis, it's a cure-all drug. I mean, like, look, I mean, I've met someone who had stage four bile duct cancer, right? It's supposed to be dead within a year. He started smoking pot, started um, making uh, hash oils. And now his cancer is in complete remission. I think he has a, a tumor maybe the size of like something smaller than a dime on his liver. It's been receding ever since. Yeah. So, I mean, you've seen people get healed from this drug, get the tumor shrunk and get them through the chemotherapy process to, um, you know, using this plant, something that these drugs can't do. Yeah. And I'm and really, gonna, I, I'm really curious about, about how, how the conversation is going to pivot now, because on the one hand, you know, if there's a move towards de decriminalization um, and we got big pharma kind of sitting right down there, I mean, I wonder how strong the push is going to be um, by those corporations to try to capture um, basically the industry uh, by making, putting forth laws or something like this. That means that everything has to go through them in order to get to the consumer. Because I mean, one of the things that makes medical marijuana such a, um, you know, a, a kind of an important cure, as you're saying, or at least aid um, in this is that it's cheap. I mean, it's a weed, you know, that's why they call it weed, right? It's easy to grow. It's something that should be kind of accessible. And I'd be very, very curious if we're going to see these folks, uh, big pharma, try to capture that and make it turn it into profit. Well, there is something with the, there's a caveat with that um, with the medical marijuana law. In order to obtain a license and open up your own dispensary, you have to have at least two hundred fifty thousand dollars to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's allowing the free market. It's allowing those with money to get behind it and those with money to do it. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. You know, the pros of that argument is you're giving it to someone who has the money and who has the experience, and it's not some fly by night. You know, mercantile. Sure, like, absolutely. It's not some fly by night business going out there doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. On the reverse end, it's only allowing those who have the money to do that to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the, now, there's only going to be about 15 dispensaries across the state, three dispensaries per, or three locations per dispensary. So it's what, 45 locations across the state, not really a lot, mm -hmm. but it can something to be built upon. And also, you're not going to be smoking pot. You know, it doesn't allow for you to smoke the green leafy plant. You can either get uh, concentrates or you can take it in a uh, pill form. So there's going to be that type of stuff there. Or you can actually get the vapor. That's what I was about to ask because I know yeah. that, that that was a, a failing of some previous legislation, right? Right. But the vapor, you can still you can still use um, concentrates to vaporize. Mm -hmm. And you can still use concentrates and oils to make edibles, which, hey, they, they both have their benefits. Let's, <laughs> let's not shy away from that. <laughs> no, and I think so. So that's on the that's that's specific to this legislation of medical marijuana decriminalization would really be a game changer in a different way though right I really think so you what yesterday or a couple of days ago you had Michelle Alexander mm -hmm. um, go on and she said something along the lines you have white people getting rich off of legalized weed while you still have black and brown people getting sent to jail for for stuff like that and it's going to be interesting because right in our backyard outside of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm you have a prison going up that's going to be the size of the Comcast Center. Think about that. And we're, what's going to happen when we have these nonviolent drug offenders? I was reading about this in the Daily News yesterday. There, in 1983, we had 13,000 inmates in Pennsylvania. Today, there's close to 51,000 inmates in Pennsylvania. Our prison population has, what, tripled yep. since that point? Yep. Almost quintu or quadrupled since that point? And why? Because of our drug policies, our war on drugs. And I really think we're starting to, I really think the next step is reversing that. Yeah, I think so too. Well, this is, is definitely, definitely going in the, in the right direction and, you know, kudos to all those activists out there and, you know, you know, kudos to those folks on the other side and the, you know, who have traditionally, I should say, uh, been on the other side of this issue in the GOP, like Mark Fulmer and so on, even verb, um, to actually come around and actually let, you know, um, you know, real stories of real people plus the actual science um, kind of win the day. And one last thing I think mm -hmm. is also really to look at this before we go to our break. Mike Verb was only one of the representatives in that. That mm -hmm. He's in a caucus of law, ex-law enforcement officers, ex-people who are in law enforcement or prosecutors or federal marshals. Mm -hmm. They all voted for this bill in the House. And that's a good thing to see.
yeah, it is a good thing to see. Well, all right, we're coming right up on a break. And uh, when we come back after the break, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, today's primary, uh, what it's looking like here in Pennsylvania, and anything else that we decide to throw into the mix before we head out and wish you well. All right. This is Kevin Mahoney's Raging Chicken Radio's Out to Coop podcast. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney. I'm sitting here with Sean Kitchen. And it is New York primary day. Uh, voters are already out at the polls in New York State. Um, and at stake is 247 delegates from New York. Uh, it's pretty crazy. We're out there. Um, and it's been pretty interesting. Uh, if you've been watching uh, TV at all, you see that the Sanders campaign is you know, they're still kind of pulling for a victory in New York. They're still kind of saying that they got the shot to win. Uh, we'll see about that. All the current polls right now show Hillary Clinton is up by at least 10 points over Sanders. And Trump, holy Trump, Trump is up by 30 points. And not over Cruz, over Kasich, right? Uh, Cruz is way back in New York State, but Trump is up by 30. And uh, this, you know, he's, it looks like he's making a run to try to shut this thing down and get this cleaned up um, to prevent that contested convention. And we're just sitting here one week away from the Pennsylvania primary. And the Pennsylvania primary right now has Clinton up by 13 points over Sanders. Um, and Trump is up by, are you ready? 20. Um, <laughs> Cruz and Kasich, you know, um, they're actually close. Kasich's not far behind Cruz. So um, that's really uh, quite an impressive thing. So things are heating up here in Pennsylvania. Uh, right now we've got, uh, you know, New York State is in play as we speak. Uh, Sean, what are you making of all this stuff today? It's primary day, man. This is freaking awesome. I love so this morning when I woke up, uh, I didn't feel like getting out of bed. I was watching a video I guess Rachel Maddow had on last night mm -hmm. about uh, that – crazy kook they had running for governor in new york a couple of years ago the republican party paladino was paladino. his name whatever yeah, yeah yeah and how crazy the republican party has gotten in new york state well he's and been he's actually been out there supporting trump i mean he's been one of what we yeah yeah up in buffalo i know and i saw the video of that but like how how crazy the republican party has gotten in this in that state you know two million registered republicans out of 20 million people mm -hmm. and it's a closed primary and well the uh, the insane asylum put that guy out there in the wake of him sending out lewd emails, racist emails, emails with hardcore porn in them. When That's that right. came out, they still elected him. He was a crazy ranting racist, and now he's supporting another crazy ranting, pandering to racist person in Donald Trump. And he's going to lock up New York State, and he might lock up Pennsylvania next week because guess what? The Republican Party in both states are very similar. The only difference is one is in charge of the legislature, the other one isn't. Yeah, no, I tell you, I tell you, the real big difference, uh, the real big difference is, is that, you know, New York State just has uh, a lot more concentration of urban centers. I mean, you know, obviously New York City gets a ton of play, but if you go run through, I mean, New York's my home state. So you run, you've got Albany right along the I-90 corridor. I mean, you've got, uh, that's the New York State Thruway. You've got Albany, you've got Utica, you've got Syracuse, you've got Rochester, you've got Buffalo. You know, these are not tiny cities. I mean, they're kind of fairly, fairly strong cities. Um, but you also do have a, you know, a whole lot of uh, the, a whole lot of the state is rural and fairly conservative, and that you know it is going to play that way. So, we'll, I mean, we'll see what happens here in Pennsylvania. I think, I think that the tendency is, is the the electorate is shifting more and more to the left. And these folks are just are grasping at, you know, the good old days when they could be racist and white guys and make jokes about women. Um, and that's what they're trying to hold on to, it would seem to me. And, uh, you know, they want to go back to the 1950s or 1930s. I mean, 1950s was even, you know, <laughs> a little bit more progressive. But I, I know, don't like, know. Um, so the other night, I'm closing out a bar after I got done bartending with the, one of the guys I work with, my friend Josh. And he saw someone he knows through a friend. And this guy comes over, starts talking to us, put all these right-wing tropes out there. Mm -hmm. You know, Bernie Sanders never did anything for veterans when he was in charge of the, the VA. Mm -hmm. um, stuff like stuff that you you just like Jesus. You just like rattle your you're pulling your hair out because these people don't know how, they don't know how government works. Right. Like Sanders was never in charge of the VA. He was in, you know on the committee that was in charge of the VA. You know, and you have to go through the committee process. They don't have civics lessons these days, I guess. No, but and frankly, Sanders passed some of the most comprehensive legislation that's ever been passed in support of veterans. So, I mean, even that doesn't hold up. Yeah, but, you know, we had a conversation afterwards. This guy started talking to us, and we're talking about voter apathy 
and what's one of the main driving forces of voter apathy. And I've always, I've been saying this for years now, for the past couple of years, it's gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is one of the lead causes of voter apathy, especially in this state. You know, when you have 65, 35 districts, you know, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the city I live in right now, is parsed up into two Senate districts. One is like a little small sliver of Harrisburg, mm -hmm. then all of Lebanon County. So Mike Fulmer's representing that, an extremely conservative county. The other one is, um, it's been parsed up where uh, Rod Templeton's district is at now, mm -hmm. is my sliver of Harrisburg and then all of Perry County, which is an extreme, one of the most rural, or rural ran down counties in the state, one of the poorest counties in the state, right next door to us. And they're gonna be voting for this person who's a multimillionaire uh, named DeSanto. And you know, about 30 seconds. And you know what's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. We're not gonna go out and go vote. I mean, if you're living in a 6535 district, what voice do you have? Absolutely, and I think I think that's a great point to make. And I think we're going to pick this up next week. Uh, we'll be actually recording uh, and kind of putting this podcast out during the Pennsylvania primary next week. And maybe we'll dig down a little bit of the numbers. Anybody who cares, if you look at the numbers right now in the PA Senate race, it looks like uh, on the Democratic side, uh, you've got Sestak at 41, McGinty at 31, and uh, my good friend John Fetterman down there at 9%. But uh, looks like Sestak's up by 10. Uh, we'll come back. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. This is Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast. Hey, man, Sean, good to, good to talk to you, and we'll talk to you next week. See you next Tuesday. All right. See you then. We're out. <laughs>